Hello everyone, this is uh, lecture number three for EC115. So uh, let's jump right in. So uh, we'll start from the end of lecture number two, just a um, recall of what we said. So we had this connected system um, that I drew up and I said, uh, so we have this connected system with these blocks they're arbitrarily, they're labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And uh, I've also labeled um, currents with the arrows for each of those blocks. So they're arbitrarily marked. There's no rhyme or reason why they are marked in the direction. But uh, once they are marked a certain way, for example, in block B, the current goes in, IB goes in. From the left, IB is going to come out from the right. So that is established for all the blocks. Okay. Again, remember that the system A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those are just some elements. And every element has a through variable, a current that flows through. And then a cross variable, which we are going to come to next. And those, that's a cross variable, that's a voltage. So those are measurements that we make on the circuit and the elements. And we can measure them any which way we like. Um, so it's an arbitrary way. And uh, the value may come out to be positive or negative, as I mentioned in uh, the previous lecture. But suppose uh, we have marked the currents, the spin arrow, we're going to measure the currents as shown. So uh, Kirchhoff's current law says, right, that's the... Uh, that's the um, one of the fundamental laws. So Kirchhoff current law says, if I go to a node, right, any node in the system, for example, node X, node Y, or node Z, or any of the other nodes, remember, a node is where uh, two or more elements are connected. So if I go to any one of those nodes, then Kirchhoff's current law says that the algebraic sum of all the currents must equal zero. Now, what does that mean? Algebraic sign uh, uh, really means that um, the uh, net current is zero. What does that mean? Well, you know, some currents are coming in and some currents are going out. They have to be balanced. So this is really a balanced equation in terms of the currents. What goes in must come out, right? Sum of what goes in must equal the sum of what comes out. When I say sum, I mean SUM, total, right? So, for example... Uh, let me make this uh, window a little smaller so you can see both the diagram and what I've written down. Okay, so let's say we've got a node X, right? Um, if we apply currents in equal to currents out terminology, you see that IB is going in to node X and ID and IE are coming out. So Kirchhoff's current law says the sum of currents in is equal to the sum of the currents out. Now we typically use the uppercase uh, Greek letter sigma to denote sum, okay, so that sigma means sum. So basically, uh, what you're seeing right here, that's uh, a formulation or that's a sort of a um, uh, equation-based description of what's written in green up there, which is Kirchhoff's current law. It's one of the most fundamental laws in circuit analysis. There's actually two of them. There's Kirchhoff's current law and there's Kirchhoff's voltage law. Those are very, very fundamental rules that apply for many circuits. In fact, all circuits. Uh, so basically, if you apply KCL at node X, you say IB is equal to IE plus IB. Now, we're not saying anything about the numerical value of IB, IE, ID, okay? But what we are saying that if we do have numerical values of IB, IE, ID, okay? I mean, they could be positive, they could be negative, we don't know. But they must, they must satisfy that equation. Okay, so whatever numbers you calculate, they better balance that equation. If not, something is wrong because you're violating uh, a flow law, basically. It's a flow equation, and then they're not balanced. Okay, similarly, we can go to node D. Sorry, I'm sorry. You can go to node Y, and if you go to node Y, you see that uh, IC and ID are coming in, and IF is exiting. So if you apply the same formulation, Kirchhoff's current law, you could easily say, of that, for example, that IC plus ID, the currents coming in, the sum of the currents coming in, is equal to the sum of the currents going out, which is IF. 
there's only one going out, so that is actually the sum of the currents coming out. Um, so this step will be the expression of KCL at node Y. We can only go to node Z, for example, right? That's a node as well. Again, when two or more elements are connected, that's a node. It's a connection point. Uh, so at node Z, on the upper left you see there, um, what's coming in? Well, there's nothing coming in. They're both going out. So at node Z, 0, there's no currents in, is equal to IA plus IB, right? Uh, and this means that IA equals minus IB, right? Um, in other words, uh, the currents are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, right? So in fact, IA and IB uh, cannot be two different magnitudes, right? They can't be two amps and something else, right? They, can't, they have to be both two amps in magnitude, but one will have a sign, like a polarity, right? In other words, if you have an equation like 0 equals IA plus IB, what we know for sure is they can't both be positive, IA and IB, and they can't both be negative. They have to have opposite sign. That's what KCL tells you. Now, as far as the numerical values of IA and IB, we don't know at this point, and the reason is because we don't know what elements are below, hiding behind A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We haven't said what those elements are. But Kirchhoff's current law has nothing to do with what those elements are, actually. Kirchhoff's current law has to do with how they are connected and in which direction we're measuring the currents. So I'm just breaking it down to the very, very uh, raw fundamental basics. Okay, So Kirchhoff's current law is exactly this. All right, um, and just as a um, sort of a extra um, uh, intuition, Kirchhoff's current law, or what we just say KCL, is it's a consequence of conservation of charge. Right, conservation of charge says charge is neither neither created or destroyed. Charge can only be transferred. Okay, so what that means basically for our circuit is that when you send some currents into a node uh, that total in must equal to the total current coming up because you cannot store charge at that node right it's a flow expression as i explained in class it's like flow in pipes the flow in must equal the flow out because we're not storing any um, you know liquid you could say at the node where the pipes are um, connected together anyway this is Kirchhoff's current law now let's go to uh, the similar system, but now let's look at voltages. So imagine a connected system, meaning that all the elements are somehow connected. Nothing is kind of hanging uh, by itself. So here's a connected system. And again, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, just some arbitrary elements connected a certain way. And again, we have arbitrarily marked voltages now. And voltages are across variables. And we have chosen to... Uh, mark the voltages as shown with the plus and the minus, right? So to properly measure a voltage, you need two points. It's a potential difference. And we have chosen to measure them this way, okay, as shown in orange. Now, Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the algebraic sum of voltages in any closed loop must equal zero, right? Remember, KCL had to do with nodes. Uh, KVL has to do with loops in fact closed loops okay and in the picture above i have shown you three closed loops right there's a loop on the left uh, which includes a b c d there's a loop on the right which includes d e uh, f g and then there's the outer loop which has a b c e f g right um, so those are all closed loops. And by the way, uh, the loops can go clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter as long as you start and end at the same point, right? So you have to, you know, maybe like, for example, to uh, make the loop on the left, the left loop, we're going to go A, B, C, A, B, D, C, in fact. So maybe you start at the uh, point uh, I'm marking down there at the bottom of A, and then you go up through A and then... Uh, left to right in B, top to bottom in D, and then um, go through C, right? So that would be a closed loop. You start and end at the at yellow point, and that's the definition of what we mean by a closed loop. So Kirchhoff's voltage law applies for closed loops. In fact, any closed loop. Any closed loop must uh, 
give you a, a net voltage of zero. Now, of course, as I said, there are what we call voltage rises and voltage drops. That was in the last lecture. So if you're going clockwise, for example, let's take the left loop, for example. Uh, when you're going clockwise in the left loop, let's say you're at the uh, bottom of node A, uh, bottom of element A. Let's say you're here. If you go to the top, you have gone through a voltage rise of VA, right? So when you go minus the plus in a certain direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, doesn't matter. if you go minus the plus, that's a rise. If you go plus to minus, that's a drop, voltage drop, okay? So that's why uh, the algebraic sum uh, is important because algebraic sign means that you, you, you take the rises and drops uh, uh, with different polar different signs, right? So let's take a look at some of these loops and I've chosen to illustrate uh, this uh, again, I, I've chosen these loops already. I've already marked them. but if you say uh, uh, if you say apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, you're saying, for example, uh, write the um, write Kirchhoff's voltage law as, for example, in a closed loop. The voltage rises, the sum of the voltage rises. remember this, this, this sigma here, right? Uh, uh, this means sum, right? Sum of the voltage rises equal to the sum of the voltage drops. So if you go take a look at the left loop, right? And if you go clockwise, you see that uh, VA is a rise, VB is a drop, VD is a drop, and VC is a rise. So when you write the equation, you write the rises on the left side, you write the drops on the right side. Now, you can say drops equals rises, but that just, you know, puts the VD, VED on the left and VA, VC on the right. The equation doesn't change. So you could go clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't really matter. But since I've drawn clockwise, I'm just sticking with it inconsistently. So VA plus VC equals to VB plus VD. So that tells you that um, when I go around the loop and I measure drops and uh, rises and drops, and I put the rises on one side, drops on the other side, uh, the numerical values must satisfy this equation. That's what your cross voltage was. It's not saying anything at this point about particularly about what those numerical values should be. It's just saying if you do have the numerical values, they must satisfy this algebraic equation okay no no options okay and if, if you don't then something is wrong because you are actually violating a fundamental uh, property okay similarly uh, again I might need to uh, zoom out a little bit so you can see both the picture and the equation if you go on the right loop again if you go clockwise again start anywhere you like uh, clockwise you see that VD is a rise, V is a drop, VG is a drop, VF is a rise. So VD plus VF are rises on the left side and V and VG are drops on the right side. And again, this was done clockwise. You can also do the outer loop, very outer loop, right? You will see that uh, you have uh, VA is a rise, VB is a drop, V is a drop, VG is a drop, and VF and VC are rises. So then you end up with the expression V plus VF plus VC is equal to VB plus VE plus VD. So as shown. Um, uh, again, I'm doing it over and over and over again, but it's just a practice that you need in order to understand this. But it's very fundamental. Um, it's very straightforward. But at the same time, uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law and previously what I've shown, Kirchhoff's current law, are very powerful. They're very powerful and they are used all the time. Now, having said that, I should also note that the the uh, uh, voltage law we just saw, Kirchhoff's voltage law, is a consequence of conservation of energy. Because what's happening is as we go around the circuit, sometimes you're getting a voltage rise, sometimes you're getting a voltage drop. In other words, sometimes uh, the system is doing work on the, on the element. Sometimes the element is doing work on the system. So those works, those energies, right, have to balance, right? And KVL is a 
consequence of conservation of energy, or you can say a statement of conservation of energy, whereas KCL is a statement of the conservation of charge. Okay? Uh, so let's move forward. And let me save to make sure I save my uh, work here. Okay, so let's go on to the next thing. And you know, uh, as, as we do these more and more, uh, we'll, um, you won't think too much about uh, all these definitions. You'll just apply them because it'll just make sense, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> You'll get a feel for it. So here's an example, and, uh, you know, I have a connected system here. And I said, determine uh, voltages VD and VG using KVL. And so v, v sub D and V sub G, they're, they're, they're sitting right here. They're here and here. Okay? And, of course, we're going to do these by using KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law. So let's do that. Um, now, the um, if you're going to determine uh, an unknown voltage by using KVL and, for that matter, KCL, what you're trying to do is write an equation in which the only unknown, right, is what you're looking for, whereas the rest of the things in the equation are known numerical values, okay? Like, for example, if you look at this left loop, and let's go uh, clockwise, for instance. In that loop, if you notice, A, B, C, D, right, are the elements, and the voltages, let's not worry about rises or drop, but the voltages for A, B, C are known, but D is not known. Well, I think we can run an equation in that loop, a KVL equation, in which we can solve for the unknown V sub D. So that's what we're looking for, okay? So let's do that. So let's write it this way, and I'll be very specific, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a KVL equation, okay, KVL equation, clockwise, and in the left loop right as shown in orange okay and the formulation is again just a reminder what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna say sum of the voltage rises must balance the sum of the voltage drops okay so again I'm repeating myself many times but I can start at any point that I like like for example um, I just tend to go to the lower left, but you can start anywhere you like. Let's say I start here. So what happens when I go in the orange clockwise direction? Well, when I go to the top of A, right, I'm going up by 7 volts, correct? That's a voltage rise. Or I'm going from minus to plus. So going from here to here, that's you're going up by 7 volts. So I'm going to write the 7 volts on the left side because it's a rise. Uh, then, when I take, uh, uh, when I go uh, right, left to right uh, for element B, right, what happens? Well, then I go down by 2 volts. That's a voltage drop. Well, the drops, I'm going to uh, write on the right side of the equation, right? I'm going to denote on the right side. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, top, on, I'm on top of um, the element D. So then when I go from the top of D to the bottom of D, again, I'm going in the direction given, given by the orange clockwise direction, right? So when I go like that, from the top of VD to the bottom, I go down by V sub D volts. That's an unknown, but it's a drop, right? Because in the clockwise direction, V sub D goes from plus to minus. So I'm going to do is I'm going to put V sub D here, like that. And then um, when I go from... Uh, the bottom of D to the left, right, I come back to where I started, I'm going up by 4 volts, right, I'm going from minus to plus, that's 4 volt rise, so I put plus 4 here, and this is my equation, right, so what I'm getting here is it says that, right, 11 equals 2 plus V sub D, well then V sub D must be 9 volts.
Does it make sense? It should. That's the only way to balance the voltages algebraically in the left loop. Otherwise, it's not balanced. So this must be true. This must be true. Okay. Um, now, uh, we know V sub D, right? Uh, we're trying to determine V sub G. Now we have a choice, right? If I want to, I could uh, maybe uh, go around the, uh, uh, the right loop this way clockwise, right? Because I know V sub D and the E and F, those voltages are known, so VG is the only unknown. I could do that, okay? I could even go and do the outer loop if I want to. If I do the outer loop, right, I'll be going this way. I'll be going, uh, sorry, I'll be going, uh, uh, let's just show it. Let's use, uh, let's different color, let's use this one here. I'll be going this way. Right? Um, actually, either one can give me V sub G. So I, I could take my choice. Obviously, if I just do the right loop, uh, there's fewer elements. So let's just do that, okay? So let's just do, okay? So we did the KVL uh, clockwise left loop. Let's do, so this was our answer. V sub D was nine volts. So let's just do uh, KVL uh, clockwise right loop. So again, I'm going to do some of the voltage rises equals to some of the voltage drops. Okay. Again, um, what I'll do is I'll start um, at the bottom of V sub D over here. And if I go up through V sub D, right, I'm going to go over here, rise of V sub D. Then I'm going to follow 3 volts, follow VG, rise of 6 volts, right? So I think you can follow that. So what I what I have is I'm going to go up by V sub D, which I know is 9 volts, but I'm writing it that way so you see it. So I'm going up by V sub D, right? And then I go down by 3 volts. Then I go down by V sub G volts. That's what I'm looking for. And then I go up by 6 volts uh, when I go when I go left right to left in the F, right? So this is plus 6. So then... Um, uh, what that tells me is that uh, V sub G is equal to VD plus 6 minus 3, right? And V sub D, I know, is already 9, right? So I have 9 plus 6 minus 3, so that's uh, 12 volts, right? So VG is 12 volts apparently, if I'm not making a mistake. Um, by the way, what would happen if I took the outer loop just as a uh, sort of a test? So it, it shouldn't matter in the direction that, it, it shouldn't matter which loop you choose. So if I chose the outside loop, okay, let's see if you can follow what I'm going to do here. Hopefully it'll work out. So KVL, clockwise outer loop so again I would do some of the voltage rise is equal to some of the voltage drops right and you know I, I would start again maybe at the bottom of A and I would just uh, balance the rise and the drops so let's go around okay so follow me uh, so when I when I start at that bottom lower left point I'm going to go up by 7 volt. It's a rise of 7. Okay. Then I go left to right on B. That's a drop of 2. Uh, left to right on E. That's drop of 3 volts. Okay. Uh, uh, top to bottom on VG. That's my unknown. Okay. And then uh, right to left on F. That's a rise of 6 volts. And right to left on C. That's a rise of 4 volts. And I'm back to where I started, right? So this will be my expression 
uh, for uh, going in the auto loop. Uh, so what am I getting there? Okay, so on the left side I have 7 plus 6 plus 4, uh, that's 17. And that equals 5. On the right you have 2 plus 3, it's 5 plus VG. And so VG again is 12 volts. So as you can see, it doesn't matter um, which direction you go, or sorry, which loop you take. As long as you take a closed loop, um, it should uh, give you actually the same result. If it doesn't, then something is wrong again. But uh, lucky for me, it worked out. Okay, so let me uh, slightly move this text so it doesn't get all jumbled up. Okay, so now we're going to do another example. All right. So in this example, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a you know circuit again, obviously uh, connected circuit. And in the connected circuit, uh, we're going to have a bunch of current values, and we're gonna determine. Um, in this case, it says you know determine I D and I G. Um, it's pretty simple again. In fact, I can illustrate this um, uh, quite easily uh, without too much trouble. Um, for example. Uh, if we're just given this information right here, you can easily see that, like for element B, right? For element B, there's five amps entering at the left. Well, whatever enters in the left of an element must come out on the right, and vice versa. So we have to have that. Therefore, you know, you have um, uh, five amps coming out like that, okay? Now uh, we have this node, okay? Here's the node. Uh, let's call it node X, for example. And at node X, we have 5 coming in, 3 going out, and ID going out. I mean, you can just see that ID has to be 2, right? Because if 5 is coming in, and a total of 5 must go out. If one of the going out, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, wires going out has, is carrying 3 amps, the other one must carry 2. I mean, you can just visually see it, but I can write the equation too, right? The equation would be this, right? You you would say um, you would say uh, KCL at X, and you would say sum of the currents in is equal to sum of the current out, right? What's coming in? Well, five is coming in. What's going out? Three plus ID. Let's solve for ID. You know, ID is equal to two amps, which is what I just said, right? So that's pretty simple. Uh, how about IG? Well, again, uh, if you look at element E, right, 3 amp is coming in through the left, and, you know, current doesn't change as it flows through the element. Voltage will drop, but the current doesn't change. So what's happening is the 3 amps that's coming in is actually going out right there. That's 3 amps. So, you know, if you want to mark this uh, connection point right here, you know, you want to call that node Y, you can see right away that 3 is coming in and 3 must flow out, so IG is 3. Uh, but uh, the reason for that is because uh, of applying Kirchhoff's current law at node Y, right? So we have to be clear about why we're getting the result. What does it do? Is it KVL? Is it KCL? Or is it something else, right? So again, KCL at Y, some of the currents in, is equal to sum of the currents out, right? So what's coming in to node Y? 3. What's going out? Well, that is a variable to be measured, IG. And that gives you that IG has to be 3 amps, right? Um, so uh, this is another illustration of uh, Kirchhoff's current law, right? So Kirchhoff's current law is, is, is you know, uh, there, it's analogous to Kirchhoff's voltage law, but Kirchhoff's current law is a balance of currents at a node. Uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law is balance of voltages around a closed loop. So they're very analogous. So once you get a feel for it, the, the equation just comes out. You don't have to think about what equation do I use. It's just it's very clear if you know how to set it up. So I hope this is helpful. Um, I'm trying to put as much... Um, information or uh, clues as much as I can so so you understand it well 
Okay, so let's now look at a, a like a, a particular element that goes in one of these boxes. So far, we just had these boxes A, B, C, D. What are they? Well, so far, all, all we were told is that, well, there's a voltage across it and there's a current through it, okay? You can measure a voltage, you can measure a current across this two-terminal element X. But what are some examples of two-terminal elements? Well, one element is the resistor, right? So if you look at a generic element X, the current and voltage are marked as shown, right? If you mark the voltage plus minus left to right, we like to measure the current left to right. That uh, choice of polarity and direction, it's called passive sign convention, right? And a resistor is defined exactly that way, but with a resistor, uh, we, we term the voltage VR and the current IR. And the element, the element, the, the resistive element or the resistor, the schematic symbol is that uh, sort of the wiggly uh, uh, sort of the symbol, right? Uh, so we have certain symbols, so certain elements, so resistors have that symbol. Now, in this uh, element, the resistor, the uh, R is actually a parameter. So VR, IR are variables, voltage and current, whereas R is a parameter that uh, describes or that characterize the property of the resistor, right? Called the resistance. So what happens is in the resistor, the, the, the VR and IR, the voltage and current, are actually directly proportional. Voltage is directly proportional to the current, and the constant of proportionality between the proportion is the resistance, R. And the expression that pretty much many of you probably already know, is Ohm's law, V equals IR. So V sub R, so we use subscripts to denote that it's it's V and V and I R for resistor. So V is equal to IR, but the point about this equation uh, highlighted in green, yellow, is that the V and the I, VR and IR, has to have a, a passive sign convention assigned polarity and direction, right? So if you assign a voltage plus minus left to right, as shown on the top of the page, then the current measurement must also go le left to right. It must flow from left to right, that measurement, right? If you mark it the other way, the current has to be measured the other way. So those have to be consistent. That's what we call passive sign convention. So passive sign convention is required when writing equation like V equals IR or RI. So this is called Ohm's law, right? Uh, v is in volts, it's a voltage, I is a current in amps, and the constant of proportionality, the resistance R, is in ohms, um, named after a um, scientist named Ohm. And uh, the unit ohms is typically known with a capital letter omega from the Greek alphabet. So you see that uh, as the unit of resistance measurement. So um, what else can we say about the resistance? Well, for any element, generic element, as shown on top of the page, Vx, Ix, that's marked with a passive sign convention pair of voltages and currents, right? Then the power absorbed is v, Vx, Ix. It's just a product of the voltage and the current. And for resistance, it's just Vr, Ir, because that's what the passive sign convention based voltage and current are. So the thing about the resistor is that the power absorbed by the resistor is given by V times I, or VR, IR, okay? Um, that power absorbed by the resistor is dissipated as heat, right? So when you uh, apply power to a resistor, it absorbs it, but it cannot store it. It dissipates it, it, it burns it, it wastes it as heat. So it'll heat up, right, to some extent. And, of course, the units of power is watts, you know, by a capital W. So when you multiply voltage and current, volts times amps, you get watts. Okay? Now, for a resistor, uh, there are two other ways of computing the power absorbed. By the way, you might ask, why do we need to know about power absorbed of a resistor? Because 
since the power absorbed by a resistor gets dissipated as heat, we have to make sure that the resistor has the proper physical size to be able to get that heat out, right? Typically, what we, what we say is that, you know, the resistor has to have enough surface area so that that heat gets um, thrown out into the air or pushed into the air somehow. Or you can put a fan over it too, I guess. But the point is that if you want to dissipate a larger amount of power, you need to have a larger, a physically larger resistance, not just the resistance value. The resistance value is not, uh, I mean, it's related in the power calculation, but the actual watts is what's important. Uh, so that's the reason why we always uh, make sure we calculate the power absorbed in the resistor. So again, there are two other ways. So, uh, and here are the two ways. So power absorbed is uh, VRIR. If you use Ohm's law, VR is RIR. And if you multiply through, power absorbed can be written as R times IR squared. So that's another way you can write the power absorbed. Or uh, instead of substituting in for the voltage, if you substitute in for the current by using Ohm's law, you can put VR over R for the current IR, again, by using Ohm's law. Then you'll get VR squared over R. So VR times IR, R IR squared, or VR squared over R, those are all equivalent expressions that will give you the same numerical value for the power absorbed in the resistor. Now, uh, these two expressions that we just derived, this one and this one, reveal that the, uh, the power dissipated in a resistor is always positive, right? Because you're squaring something. So it doesn't matter if IR you measured was going in the opposite direction of where you thought it was going. It doesn't matter, you're gonna square anyway. So for power calculations, you see that it's, it's always the square of the voltage or the current, and therefore, the power absorbed by a resistor is always positive, okay? Uh, the only way it can be uh, zero if either I or V is zero. But other than that, you're gonna get a positive number. Let's say a non-negative number for sure, okay? So again, uh, these three expressions can be used interchangeably. They're identical and they're gonna give you the same numerical result no matter what. But it's good to know um, all three. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's go and uh, uh, look at some, um, some simple uh, calculations. For example, let's say we have a resistor, uh, three ohm resistor and the current through is four amps. Uh, what's the voltage? What's the uh, power dissipated? Well, since we know the current, by using Ohm's law, VR is R times IR. Well, IR is four amps, that's given. Three ohms is given. If you multiply them, you get 12 volts. So the voltage across the resistor must be 12 volts. What's the power dissipated? Well, VR times IR. IR is four, VR we just calculated, 12 volts, you get 48 watts. So 48 watts is dissipated in the resistor as heat. Okay. Um, now, we could have uh, elected to uh, you know, say, for example, we could have said, hey, I want to calculate the power dissipation by using, for example, R times IR squared. That's the second alternate expression for power absorbed. I could have done that too, right? So for R, right, we have 3 ohms. And IR is 4 amps. So that would be 4 amps squared. So that would be numerically 3 times 16, and that is actually 48 watts. So in fact, in this problem, uh, in the beginning, well, we were just given IR and the 3 ohms. We didn't know VR, so we didn't actually have to know VR to calculate the power dissipated, right, for resistor. So we could have done it this way. Um, here's another problem. So here... Uh, the voltage is given, and we're just supposed to find the current. Again, uh, voltage is 8 volts, resistance is 2 ohms. Ohm's law says that V equals Ri. So I is V over R. V is 8 volts. R is 2 ohms. You get 4 amps. 
what's the power dissipated? The product of the voltage and the current, 8 volts, 4 amps, 32 watts. Again, in this case, we could have used the ultimate expression. For example, we could have used this one, as well as the RIR squared. We can use either one. But in this problem, if you look at the problem statement, right, on the left, the picture, you have 8 volts and 2 ohms. You don't need to calculate IR, actually, to calculate the uh, power dissipation because everything is interrelated. So you could have said um, that the power dissipation uh, can also be calculated by doing VR squared over R. What's VR squared? Well, that's 8 volts, right? It's 8 squared divided by R. That's 2, right? So what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get uh, 64 over 2, which is 32 watts. So it doesn't matter actually which way you do it, but it's good to know all of them because sometimes one is more convenient, sometimes something else is more convenient. But the point is that they are all equivalent. Okay, so they're going to give you the same numerical result. All right, so let's move on. Um, so that was our first two term element. Let's introduce another element. So another common two term element is the independent voltage source. And the example, uh, one practical example of a independent voltage source is a battery. Although a real battery has some non-idealities, but you know, for our case, let's just consider it to be as shown here. So as shown on the left, a generic element with passive sign convention has V and I sort of measured as shown on the far left. So uh, an independent voltage source uh, is, uh, has a, a schematic symbol as shown in the middle where uh, you have a polarity plus minus Vs. So that Vs can be a constant, you know, capital Vs. Uh, that Vs also can be a function of time where it can be written as Vs as a function of T, right? It can be a sine wave, for example. Um, and superimposing on that, we have the blue Vx and Ix showing how the uh, generic element voltages and currents are, are relating to that um, element. So an independent voltage source with passive sign convention is shown, shown in the middle. And on the far right, we're showing a battery. Again, uh, a battery uh, typically is a, a constant voltage. Um, and uh, But the battery uh, Vs with that uh, symbols, those, uh, you know, uh, the the long lines and short lines, those uh, model, those are indication of cells in a battery. Um, that and drawing a circle with capital Vs, they mean the same thing in circuit analysis. Um, uh, but schematically, electronically, they might mean a different kind of component. But for us, they are really the same. Now, the question is, what does it mean to have an independent voltage source? What is that independence? Okay, what does that mean? Well, what you're seeing is that in an independent voltage source, the voltage is known, right? Because if you look at the blue VX that's marked across the symbols, the that, that VX is equal to VS, right? V, that VS can be a constant or a function of time, doesn't matter. The VX, the voltage of the element is, is known, is given, okay? But the current IX that flows through the element is anything. It could be zero. It could be positive. It could be negative. But the point is the source voltage, Vs, again, Vs can be a constant function of time. It's independent. In other words, it's not a function of the current. Now, in a resistance, V and I are related. V equals to Ri. Uh, in a voltage source, V is given. It is what it is. The current through it depends on what's connected to that voltage source. So we need to determine that by doing analysis. But the point is, when you say independent voltage source, it means the voltage is independent, not a function of the current. That's what it means. Um, and, of course... You want to calculate the power absorbed by element X, you just multiply the V and the I. So you just say Vx Ix, but because Vx is equal to Vs, the known voltage, you just get Vs Ix. Now, Vs we know, 
But ix can be anything. It can be positive. It can be negative. It can be zero. So because of that, the power absorbed uh, by an independent voltage source can be positive, can be negative, can be, it can even be zero. But typically, you know, positive or negative. And what happens is we, because we have two cases, we make this distinction. So we say that if uh, power is absorbed by the voltage source, so what we're doing is we're sending power into the voltage source. Uh, when we're doing that, then power absorbed by the voltage source is positive. So when that's happening, we're sending power into the voltage source. The voltage source absorbs it and stores that power, stores that energy. Okay, So we can say it's being charged. So when you're charging a battery, you're sending power, right? Uh, and power over time is energy. You're sending it into the battery, you're charging your battery. Whereas uh, if the power absorbed turns out to be negative, right? If we do Vx, Ix and get a negative number, it means that the source is actually generating power. It's being discharged, right? So that means that the, the source is providing power to the circuit. It's not absorbing power, it's the opposite. It's sort of uh, it taking the power that's been stored and it's providing to the circuit, it's generating, it's delivering that power to the circuit. So then we say that the source, the voltage source, is being discharged. So that's just notation, right? And I'm sure if you have, uh, you know, let's say your, your, your smartphone, and when you plug into the wall, you're charging it, so you're sending power into it, right? Uh, whereas if it's not being charged, then that means the battery in your phone is actually being discharged, right? And the power absorbed is negative. So it's actually delivering power. Um, so anyway, this is something, it's terminology, but again, if you think about it a little bit, um, it, it, it makes common sense, right? It, it makes sense uh, and once you can make it make sense to yourself then you don't really have to think about definitions too much but you want to get to a point where it seems kind of almost like obvious as to what's going on okay so let's move on and let's look at the circuit right so here's a circuit now we have two elements and um, you know we have one loop if you want to think about it and uh, we have a voltage source, right? Uh, we have a voltage source. And uh, I mark the Vx, Ix for the voltage source, as shown. And then I have a, we have a resistor, and I mark the quote-unquote Vx, Ix for the resistor. But I didn't put the X, I put R, right? Vr, Ir. And the question is, it says, find the uh, voltages, uh, find the voltage Vr, find the current Ir and Ix, and the power absorbed by the resistor and the voltage source. Okay, let's just do it. Um, again, you can do this many different ways, but I started it off by saying, let's do KVL clockwise. Okay, so let's go this way. Let's do KVL clockwise. So when you do KVL clockwise, you have rises and drops. So by now, I think, because of the examples that we did, you, you know that if I start over here, you know, if I go clockwise, I'm going to go up by 12 and I'm going to down, go down by VR. So the consequence of writing this is saying uh, 12 is a rise and uh, VR is a drop. So, you know, it's pretty obvious, right, that uh, that VR is going to be 12 volts. Let me just move these a little bit, right? So from here, VR equals... 12 volts so we know that already um, okay so what else do we have well if we know VR you know IR because of Ohm's law in a resistor VR and IR are related so VR is RIR right um, and that means the current is V over R and so VR is 12 volts we found that right and then R is 3 ohms that means IR must be 4 amps okay so now we to determine VR and IR, and then we now we have to figure out, because we're just going down the line. We've got VR, we've got IR. Let's do IX. Okay, to figure out IX, then we have to use uh, Kirchhoff's current law. In fact, we're going to apply Kirchhoff's current law at this top node. You can call this the top node if you like. The top wire, you could say, 
right? So if you look over there, and if, uh, if I apply Kirchhoff's current law, the top node, current single with current south, notice that both IX and IR are coming out of the node. So actually, there's nothing going in, right? So what you have there is you have, um, sorry, let me use the right pen here. Okay, so what you have there, you have zero going in, right? Nothing in. And then you have IX plus IR coming up. So that means IX is equal to minus IR is equal to minus 4 amps, right? I mean, that makes sense because IR, uh, this current, is 4 amps. So that means this current must be minus 4 amps, right? I mean, there aren't really two currents. There are two ways of measuring it. IR is being measured in the clockwise direction, right? In the direction of the orange arrow. So that would be 4. Uh, IX, if you notice, is being measured in the counterclockwise direction. So that must be minus 4. So it means that uh, the currents are equal and opposite. If you remember, I gave you an example before without giving any numerical values as to how, why that was that way. But anyway, that's how it turns out be, uh, it, what it turns out being. So IX is actually minus 4 amps. Right. Um, all right. So how do we calculate power dissipation? Well, for the resistor, it's VRIR. It's the product of voltage and current, and we already calculated those, right? So what's VR times IR? Well, VR we calculated as 12 volts, right? And the uh, uh, IR is 4 amps. We get 40 watts. Uh, how about the part of speed in the 12-volt resistor? It's VXIX, right? Well, VX is just capital VS. It's just 12 volts, right? And IX, we just calculated minus 4 amps. So you get minus 48 watts, right? So this is minus 48 watts uh, dissipated. Now, instead of dissipated, I could also use the words absorbed. So when you say absorbed, and so I actually use absorbed here just to uh, keep it in the same terminology. Okay, power absorbed like that. Okay, so power absorbed by the three ohm resistor is 48 watts. Power absorbed by the 12 ohm resistor minus 48 watts so if the, this is negative um, what that's really saying is that um, this is equivalent to saying uh, plus 48 watts generated right now um, you don't have to think about that but if you just do vxix for every element there's something called conservation of power and conservation of power says that if you go to each element, as we did here, and just do passive sign convention, VI um, variables, right? Measure the V and I according to passive sign convention. Then you, for each element, just do V times I, as we did right here. And if you add them up algebraically, they must equal zero. Right? So it says something like this. The power absorbed the sum of power absorbed for elements for, for a circuit that has k elements must equal to zero. So in our case, basically what's happening is this would mean that the power absorbed by the three ohm resistor plus the power absorbed by the 12 volt voltage source must equal zero. Does it? It does, right? Because you have what? You have, you have 40, 48, I'll write them in orange so you can see it, right? So you have 48 minus 48 equals 0, yes, right? It's got to, right? So um, just in um, uh, uh, just a few elements, right? We've already um, uh, gone through some very, very fundamental law, Kirchhoff voltage or Kirchhoff current law. But not only that, uh, we have stated that these laws and some of the analysis that goes on with it cover things like conservation of charge,
conservation of energy and conservation of power. These are very, very, very fundamental ideas that go across many different kinds of uh, fields, right? But it works in circuit anal analysis as well, okay? So, um, so let's go on to uh, um, another element, okay, another element. We don't want to this thing saving right now. Let me move on. Here we go. Now, what is that element? That element is what's called a current source, independent current source. So again, it's a, another example of element that fits into this VXIX business. Now, in this case, it's very similar, okay, but now instead of the, the voltage being equal to some given value, now the current equals some given value. So in this case, the current IS, either a constant or a function of time, is uh, is equal to just the current IX. The, the current of the element is defined. Voltage of the element, VX, can be anything, right? So the main difference here is that there is no physical equivalent of a battery for a current source, right? So you can go to the store and buy a AA battery, but you can't go to the store and buy a AA current source, right? Um, so there's no such thing, but we can actually design circuits that behave like current sources. So there's a little bit of a difference there, but the formality is identical, right, in terms of circuit analysis is concerned. So independent current source, current is known, so that IX value is either IS or capital IS, right, something like that. Um, but the voltage VX can be anything, including zero volts. So the source current, the IS term, is independent, it's not a function of the voltage. That's why we call it an independent current source. All right, and again, the power absorbed is Vx Ix, and since Ix is known, you multiply Is by Vx to get the power absorbed. But since Vx is independent, right, sorry, since the current is independent of Vx, Vx can be anything. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be zero. So that, that's why the power absorbed by the current source can be positive or negative, right? So just like before, if the power absorbed by the current source is positive, we'd say it's absorbing power and it's being charged. So the current source is being charged. If it's less than zero, it means that it's actually generating power. It's being discharged. So it's very similar. That's why I'm going through a little fat. It's very similar to the independent voltage source, but now the current is what's defined, and voltage is what's sort of free to be whatever it wants to be. Again, you have a current source, you apply it to the circuit, the current source value is known, either a constant or a function of time, but the voltage that's measured across it depends on what's connected to the current source, to the current source, right? So let's do a little example. Again, a very similar example, let's find, uh, you know, VR, IR, IX, and the power of by the resistor and the voltage source. Um, uh, so let's just do it. Um, let's do the, um, so I, I already set it up, uh, so there's not too much to actually, um, to do actually. Uh, but let's do KCL at the top node. Okay, so again, we'll take the top node. Here's the top node. So what's going on is we have the current to amp source bringing current into it uh, and IR is coming out, right? That's how we're measuring the current through resistor. So if you apply current into the current out, what's the current that's coming in at the top node? Two amps. What's leading? IR, well then obviously uh, IR is two amps. Of course, if you know IR, you know VR by Ohm's law, right? Because what you know is that the resistance uh, is in this case five ohms IR you just calculated two amps so that says VR is 10 volts right now if you know so we, we found basically VR and IR how about uh, uh, not IX I said IX here but what I meant is VX because IX is given so let's just calculate VX here so Vx will calculate by doing um, um, a loop, right? Going around the loop this way, right? So we'll do rise equal to drops. Start anywhere you like. For example, start right here, right? 
So if you go clockwise, you go plus to minus, drop the x, and then plus to minus, drop the r, right? So those both are drops. There are no rises. So what this gives you is that 0 equals vx plus vr. In other words, you get that vx is equal to minus vr, which is equal to minus 10 volts. So now we calculate as vx. Now we're going to calculate the power absorbed. I think I put the dissipated here. Dissipated is true for resistance. Power absorbed and power dissipated for resistor are the same, but sources don't dissipate power. They absorb, right? Because they're storing. They're not generating heat, typically. So let's just write absorb to be totally clear here. So what's the power absorbed of the 5 ohm resistor? Well, it's just a product of the V and the I we just calculated. What's VR? 10 volts. What's IR? 2 amps. That must be 20 watts. And the power is up for a 2 amp source, VX, IX. Again, uh, VX we calculate to be minus 10 volts. And of course, IS is given. That's the, uh, that's the 2 amps, right? That's the 2 amps. So you get minus 20 watts. And as we said before, uh, conservation of power says, right, some of, the po some of the power absorbed for all elements K in a circuit must equal zero, is it? So in this case, we have two elements. So we must take the power absorbed by the 5 ohm plus the power absorbed by the 2 amp. And we have 20 watts minus 20 watts equals zero. Good, it is satisfied. Again, this applies to any circuit with any elements. I'm just illustrating for the simple case, but if you had more elements, this power absorbed uh, must, uh, must also uh, be true. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, I hope uh, this has been useful. I, I, I try to... Um, uh, I try to go as, as much detail. I know I, you know, uh, said certain things multiple times and uh, maybe a little too wordy here and there. Uh, but I'm hoping that, uh, that you were able to uh, pick this up and um, understand it uh, and uh, make sense of it. Um, either way, I, I hope you, you'll find it useful. And... Uh, Hopefully, we'll see you in class uh, next week. Um, but for now, I'm going to sign off, and uh, we'll see everybody in class next week. Thank you.